Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport um, and um, general transportation alternatives. We're going to talk about schools today. And uh, while I will point out that schools uh, are, at least in Germany, the second strongest market for uh, public transport by model split after work trips, um, even in highly transit-oriented places like Berlin, the trains don't own the system. Uh, the, uh, um, th there's quite a lot of people who bike or walk. And now I do want to point out that this is an issue that, certainly in the United States, there's a lot of difficulty talking about it. And let me point out to you the difficulty. So while trying to prep, I googled map of New York City high schools. This is because I tried to do the same in Berlin and did not get anything good. Um, and, uh, so let's just look at what we're getting here. And, and I would like to, uh, point out that from the first page of results, exclusive, how safe are, uh, New York City's schools, um, with, uh, the red, yellow, green color scheme. Uh, and now, uh, um, what else? And so, so instead of getting descriptive statistics, so what I was hoping to get here is a map that just has a pin at every high school in New York City. Um, and instead, what I'm getting, and, and instead of getting descriptive statistics, I'm already getting people complaining about safety and from uh, and once in a while a leftist uh, um, complains about school segregation. Um, this is, so this is actually something that um, um, people who are more plugged into New York City activism told us as we were founding the Effective Transit Alliance, ETA, uh, this org, um, that um, one of the things that um, we were trying to th think about is uh, good uh, uh, programs to work on is um, how to, is talking about how to make it easier for people to use public transportation to get to school. And we were told by people who are more plugged into New York area activism not to even talk about schools because if you talk, because if you say the word school, in Metro New York, and I think also in the rest of the United States, you will get racists. You will get racists who think that the um, purpose of all education activism is to keep is to keep black people away from schools, and they will um, say that you're the real racist for saying that what they're trying to do is keep black people out because uh, instead they make all of these uh, they talk about all of these circumlocutions. Um, hence, people talk about crime, in which crime somehow never means um, a school where uh, queer students uh, are beaten up for being queer or where um, there's a lot of racist bullying against racial minorities. It's always um, for, for the racist crime means is, is all, crime only counts as crime if it's done by a member of a racial minority. Um, and yeah, and this is actually, this actually means that a lot of technical issues about how to get schools to be easy, to be more accessible by non- uh, car modes of transportation that just doesn't really happen in, in anywhere in the American conversation, just because uh, um, j uh, just because anytime you try to talk about schools, some uh, person who thinks that again the purpose of the school system is to enforce racial segregation comes out of the woodwork. It's um, hell. I had I mean I literally had to ban such a person from my blog at one point. Um. Literally, only time I ever banned someone for, um, from a blog on content as opposed to spam. Um, while we're talking about the United States, I want to give an example that I may have vlogged before, but not on a dedicated thing about school, and this is Fetchburg. Why Fetchburg? Um, it's just an example that I know of. Um, so in Massachusetts, uh, the way the system works is... Uh, in Massachusetts, the state will give grants to municipalities to build new schools. Uh, this tends to encourage looking for new locations for schools rather than repairing schools, uh, expanding schools where they exist. And um, and I give the and I give the example of Fitchburg because Fitchburg is not a suburb. I mean, Fitchburg is being turned into a suburb, but Fitchburg is a town that has an that had an independent existence, and it's the same as a place like Worcester. Um, Lowell. Lowell was not founded to be a suburb. Lowell was founded as an industrial 
um, town, uh, right on the river for the water power for the fa for the very early factories. Um, same thing with uh, um, same thing with uh, uh, Lawrence and Haverhill. Salem is literally famous from the 17th century, or I should say, infamous. Um, so, so all of these places are places where, um, just because we were talking about regional rail in the Boston area and how you could anchor things to city center, so I poked around. Uh, again, we're, it, it, it just happened to be Fetchburg where we were parking around, and here's the high school in Fetchburg. It you so the so Fetchburg High School used to be in city center, and then using this state grant, they moved not city center. This is the current location of the high school in Fetchburg. Does this look to you guys as a place where any person could ever get to by any means of transportation other than a car? In theory. A sufficiently masochistic, even in theory, even in practice, a sufficiently masochistic um, cyclist could do it on a bike, um, but only from certain places. Um, public transport is just completely irrelevant here, and because the school, no, it's not on the way to anything, so the buses would have to just go to school and loop back. Um, the yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, the part where uh, the part where in in uh, in the United Kingdom, the um, racial group that goes to uni at the lowest rate is white people, just because um, there's a lot of uh, I think there's a lot of um, regional inequality there, um, and racial minorities in Britain are disproportionately in London. I think something like one third. I don't remember if it's one third of non-white England or one-third of non-white Britain. I think it's one-third of non-white Britain lives in London. One-tenth of white Britain lives in London. Um, it's also a big dampener on, um, uh, it's also a big dampener on uh, racial inequality and in income um, in the United Kingdom, just because uh, the, I mean, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, immigrants move to where the jobs are. So where the people of color, where, where the British um, African minority ethnics, the, BME, the BAMEs, um, they are in London because that's where the jobs are, and there there are a handful in Birmingham because um, a bunch of them started moving in in the sixties when Birmingham still had jobs. Um, smattering of people in like Manchester, Leeds, certainly not the sort of deindustrialized town that thinks of Leeds as a bustling metropolis. Um, yeah, yeah, and so the. Um, but anyway, so the point is that um, the schools in, in the United States tend not to be accessible by any mode except the car. Now, there are school buses, um, but the problem is school buses mean that so much of America has two separate fleets of buses. One is yellow, uh, or at least historically yellow, I don't know what they look like now, uh, and can only be used for schools. The other is any other color and is not really useful is not really useful for the schools um now in the more transit oriented places they can use city buses to get to school um i'm gonna get into examples in new york and also vancouver uh in a moment um, and again in germany people do use um public transport to get to school um they all they also walk or bike so how do you make sure that, that such a thing is viable? Um, and, and if you're wondering why you want to make sure such a thing is viable, just think how much wasted time and wasted energy comes from parents having to chauffeur their kids to school, right? Because the um, because the, these are trips where the average occupancy in the car is one half, right? Because the parent lives somewhere random within the municipal limits of uh, Fetchburg. Let's make up this spot um, on Lunenburg Street. So parent drives the kid to school. The parent does not work at school, so the parent has to drive back home or drive to work. Uh, and um, the location of the school is not on the way to work. Um, because the, the parent is unlikely to be working in this direction. There's like, look at Ashby, there's nothing there, right? I mean, it's not, so it's not like somehow the school is strategically located to be on the way from residential areas to auto-oriented job centers. 
to the contrary, the auto-oriented job centers are in this direction. Um, because the auto-oriented job centers are generally going to be near freeways and freeway uh, interchanges. So quite a lot of stuff would follow uh, 495 um, or closer in um, what is nationally signed as I-95, but is locally called Route 128. Lots and lots of jobs around here. Around here, they're very auto-oriented. Um, I don't know to what extent people commute all the way from Fitchburg there. Um, you can mentally substitute to Lowell or something. <coughs> or Framingham. Um, but it's, it's the same thing. So the school is not on the way to anything. So the point is that the parent drives to school and back, um, wasting a lot of time that they could be doing literally anything else. Uh, the parent then also wastes energy because um, these are car kilometers with, again, the um, parent is dead weight on this. The parent is not, it's not like a carpool, right? I mean, if if there's a carpool, let's say the parent is actually a teacher, then it's a carpool. That isn't a, it's a normal carpool. With the, I mean, has a kid in the carpool, but still, I mean, the, the parent who is a teacher drives to school. Uh, it's for two people. There are two people in the car, the parent and the kid. The kid goes to school as a student, the parent as a teacher. Um, and on the way back, same thing. But no, if the parent just is chauffeuring the kid, then the kid is the only passenger who's relevant for, for transport purposes. So uh, one person in the car who's relevant, zero people in the car who are relevant, yeah. It's, so it wastes energy, it wastes a lot of time. If you do a school bus system, the problem is because the school buses um, are extremely peaky because classes start in the morning and end in the afternoon, it creates, again, creates so much waste that a lot of American school districts have done some horrific things. And we're talking, we're talking having to stagger the start times of different schools um, let's say the high school, the middle school, and the elementary school, and the, and the way that it ends up working is that there are classes that start at seven in the morning, so seven to seven thirty in the morning, sometimes even earlier. Um, they literally make people, some teachers, some students, wake up before six in the morning. Um, even six a.m. is considered a normal time for for a teacher in America to wake up, um, and. Uh, this and often and often this is also moralized as oh it's a good thing for for people to learn to rise early, um, which is kind of which is something I've always found weird because I do not perceive American schools as especially strict um, or, or especially um, moralizing in that sense. Um, it's mostly the uniforms, right? Because most of the world is on school uniforms. The places that don't, it's Western Europe, and I guess also Israel, which is imitating Western Europe and the United States and, and, and Canada. So maybe, I, so I perceive these areas as maybe chiller about like children having like more rights or something than when I think about British schools or something. And then some of the Americans keep imposing these zero hours on, on, on students where, yeah, you need to show up at seven in the morning. Um, and yeah, you're going to be tired all day. Um, and not be able to concentrate. You know, that's fine. I mean, that's. You know, I mean, someone needs to. Uh, so, someone, someone needs to be serving food to the people who, either for random reasons or because they managed to snag later opening uh, hours, did manage to pay attention. Um, and so, so, th so there's a, so this is an, a huge inefficiency. Um, again, in transportation, in in education as well. Um, and it comes from the fact that schools are not accessible except by car. Remember, the vast majority of uh, of the vast majority of pupils cannot drive. Um, some places let people drive at age sixteen in the United States. I believe it's getting less common, and uh, in, in more and more states in the last twenty years have raised the driving age to seventeen or eighteen, or maybe they require a parent to be in the car while a 16 or 17 year old is driving, which means that independent driving to school is just not going to happen. Um, and uh, the um, and that's another high cost of a private car that the student is, then needs to, to drive, right? Because a new car in America is what, 30K, 40K? The car is only going to be useful that way for two years because then... Um, so the majority of Americans 
at age 18 go to college. Not all of them will finish. I think less than the majority. It's a small enough majority that um, a majority of Americans of age of having just graduated college did not graduate college, but it's very close. I think it's 46% or something like that. And I, I think it starts at like 70%. There's so a lot of dropping out. So the point is that this is a car and so and colleges, yeah, some of them are commuter colleges, um, but they too don't really need to be auto oriented. So essentially this is a 30K expense that's amortized over somewhere between two and four ish years. Uh, and um, plus all the upkeep costs of it and isn't especially useful otherwise if you make the schools more uh and so here okay oh god i'm so sorry okay um can you remind me where here is um combat wombat Yeah, the uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of bullshit zero tolerance. Um, bullshit zero tolerance that I need to mention did not happen to me in Israel. Um, and I would like to also, when I say Israel, I mean, you probably don't think of schools that are especially good. So let me tell you that the school that I went to in Tel Aviv, uh, it's called Ironi Dalet, and I will never be able to um, find it on a uh, um, on a map um, unaided. So instead of pretending, not Ryan Ioni Dalet. There's junior high and high. It's a combined grade seven to twelve school. It's pretty common, but the uh, but grade seven and no, not in Ashkelon, you idiots. Ioni Dalet. So there's, uh, so this is called the branch. Uh, it's again, it's for seventh and eighth grade. Um, and I left in the middle of seventh, so I barely got to go to the main campus, which is walking distance to this. Um, this is probably, this is considered, I think, the highest quality public school as opposed to charter. There are no private schools in Israel. Either in the entire country or certainly in the city, and the city is almost the wealthiest in the country. So um, when I'm telling you that there was no zero tolerance shit here and that the school started at eight, I don't remember if eight twenty or eight thirty. Um, this is like what I mean. Oh, Tallahassee. Ugh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, there, there's yeah the stagger. I mean, I get why they stagger, but um, it's just a matter of transportation inefficiency. And here's by the way how I rode how I got to the school. Um, on the way back, I would either take the bus, the bus being line number five, it was at the time Tel Aviv's busiest and also most frequently bombed. Um, I, I would take it back and going there, I would either take, uh, going there, I think I would always take the bus and going back, I would either take the bus back or walk. Uh, I didn't generally like walking in the morning because I was in a hurry, but on the way back, I can walk back with friends or something and I'm not wasting time that I could be sleeping. And so I bring I bring this up because you want the schools to be embedded in the city. Again, this is a randomly selected places in this. I mean, not literally randomly selected. It's in North Tel Aviv, not South Tel Aviv. But given the constraint that it should be in a um, uh, in a middle class neighborhood, it's in a pretty random location. Is um, uh, this is actually pretty common for schools. Um, they are not at all centralized. And this is this is why I was trying to get the map of uh, New York City high schools. Um, now, in some cases, centralization can be useful. And in, in the case of New York, the issue is the specialized high schools. The, so Americans know what a magnet school is, a magnet school. Is, so the United States does not have the concept of a gymnasium the way Germany does, but it has the concept of a magnet school. Gymnasium is, let's say, top 30, 40% at this point. Um, Magnet school is top few percent, um, probably about as biased as a gymnasium in the sense that it uh, depends on whether the parents were sufficiently middle class and sufficiently caring for the teachers to assign the kids to that. Um, in New York, they aren't called magnet schools; they're called specialized schools, and uh, they uh, and entrances by competitive exam, where 
the higher where I think three percent, not literally the top three percent, but thereabouts of the cohort gets to go there. Um, so the one that's hardest to get into is called Stuyvesant, and I never remember where it is, but it's around here, around Battery Park City. Um, it's actually a really good location for a school that will grow citywide because uh, the subway makes it really hard to get there. The other two are called um, Bronx Science, which is, I don't remember where, I think it's around here. And Brooklyn Tech, which is downtown Brooklyn ish. So let me check where Brooklyn Tech is because obviously I know it's in Brooklyn, but I don't know where in Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn, yeah, yeah. So downtown Brooklyn is also a really good location. Um, Bronx Science is the one with a poor location, and uh, people who. Uh, People who are familiar with the NumTot, uh, the Facebook group, uh, with, with the NumTot Facebook group, uh, may know who Juliet Eldred, the founder and uh, BDFL of the group, um, is. Uh, she grew up in New York City, um, I believe on the Upper West Side. She went to Bronx Science, and this was a really bum commute for her because, look, it's kind of out of the way. Um, it, um, so, so it's, it, it's a weird, uh, getting, uh, I, I think from Upper West and maybe a two to four, I mean, it, it was a difficult commute. Um, and, uh, and again, these schools draw citywide. Um, now they don't draw equally citywide. There are, um, neighborhoods that are closer feeders than others. I think probably the, the, the probably the most common, the, the, the most common neighborhood would probably be. Asian enclaves, um, Stuyvesant. It's Stuyvesant is majority Asian. Sorry, Stuyvesant is majority Chinese. It's super majority Asian, including let's say Indians, Koreans. So I'm imagining that the top feeder neighborhoods would be Flushing and Sunset Park. Now you should not space citywide schools based on a uh, based on an immigrant pattern that is maybe twenty years that's maybe twenty years old and eventually going to dissipate. But um, but this does lead to a lot of commute pain from schools that, again, are supposed to grow citywide. And so for these, again, the Stuyvesant and Brooklyn tech locations are good. But for something like Bronx Science, they might want to try to um, look for a location that's easier to get to from the rest of the city. Or, I, I mean, probably for prestige and name reasons, they do not want to move it where it's most optimal, which probably will be Long Island City. Um, but they should consider at least putting it in the most accessible part of the Bronx, if it's possible. So, but again, this is... Pretty unique, a pretty unique case of a school that uh, draws citywide in a large city, so not Fitchburg. Um, and um, now, again, in, in Berlin, it's very different um, because in Berlin, the class system works very differently. It's again, it's not top one percent or top three percent. It's, um, I think, top 20, 30, 40 percent. And there are gradations within the gymnasium. Um, there's a lot of specialization within the gymnasium. I do, um, but I don't think there is a school here that's just the top two percent um, of the city. Maybe the French school, but that's if you're thinking of having a rather French career afterward. It's essentially a school that graduates you perfectly trilingual, um, and it lets you take the Bach and not the Abitur, um, for trilingual, because at this point, if you graduate a Hauptschule in Berlin, you know how to speak English, let alone snootiest high school in the city, snootiest gymnasium in the city. I think the French school is around here, so pretty close to city center. Um, but in general, the even the gymnasium in Berlin, um, they're spread pretty evenly around the city. Now, what does this mean? I keep talking in all these videos and on my blog about how important it is for centralization uh, to, to have centralization if you want a strong public transit network uh, because at the end of the day um, even a, a, even a Berlin Mitte without road diets with very wide roads some of these roads are very wide and rather fast with car traffic um, like Alexanderstrasse says like this um, this is um, also rather hard for a pedestrian to cross even here I mean it's, this is not a very nice pedestrian environment that still has a very high non-auto model split because there's a lot of density of things around. And yeah, the car traffic is very difficult to get around. 
but it's not especially fast. I mean, yeah, the cars go 40, 50 kilometers an hour, but um, they still have to stop for lights. They still have to stop whenever there's traffic. If you're traveling where everyone else goes, when everyone else goes there, there is traffic. Um, this is not a pleasant environment for the drivers. The reason that um, the, the the reason that Kaifa, I mean, the main reason that Kaifa Agda managed to ride to victory on a platform of uh, um, cars or pe- essentially was cars are people too. Um, and yeah, it sounds ridiculous. Yeah, Kaifa Agda is ridiculous. Um, but um, about, um, a policy of not uh, closing off parking spots to build bike lanes. Um, I mean, the drivers are aggrieved. I mean, the drivers really don't like driving in a city. They just think that the reason is because of the bike lanes and not just and not because it's a dense city. You want to have a nice drive, um, stay in like Eifdelan in like Eastern Brandenburg or something like that, and uh, don't ever go to the city. The city does not have room for your cars and the cars of all the other ZDU voters. Um, and so the, 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 this is the fundamental reason why model splits in big cities are always higher than everywhere else. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, Berlin has the highest model split for public transport and for not cars in Germany. There's a reason. Um, and so, so it's talking about, about not specialization, about centralization, um, and also centralization of jobs, cities with, where jobs are centralized around city center. Huh. I thought that in New York the buses I thought I thought in New York they specifically did not have school buses for people above I believe sixth or seventh grade. That it was uh that they instead subsidized people on the subway. Um Singapore is also a very TOD and Singapore is a public system. I mean very classist public system. Very very tracked public system, but it's public. Like in in Singapore or the um, the snooty um, junior colleges in Singapore are what in American terms would be called a charter. Um, I, I, I believe their level of independence is probably the same as that of a German gymnasium or something like that, but they're not at all private. <coughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that could be a special case. Um, oh, God, I'm sorry. Oh, ba- oh, right, base, I guess. Um, yeah, ugh. Yeah, and so, so I talk about centralization because, yeah, I mean, when you need to go to a, a place like Bronx Science and you're not from that area, even if you're from the Upper West Side, which I think a two-seat ride, let alone Bayside, that's still kind of painful. So you want to put it in, in a more central area. And the point is that it's just much easier to use public transport in centralized places. So I talk about big cities versus non-big cities, but also strong city centers versus weak ones. Um, I keep giving the example of Los Angeles and it's very weak central business district to the point that um, Los Angeles, Metro Los Angeles has 18 million people, Metro, the Metro Bay Area, even counting things like Silicon Valley and San Jose is about 9 or 10 million. Downtown San Francisco has more jobs than downtown LA. Um, and uh, down t- and the Chicago Loop, it's about also about ten million more jobs in downtown LA. Um, the um, and, and that, that that I don't think it's the reason LA has weak transit. It's two things that have reinforced each other. That is to say, weak city center means people mostly drive. Um, in Los Angeles, as I keep reminding people, about fifty percent of people who work in downtown LA take public transport to work, region wide. Even taking, even not counting the inland it's five percent. Um, it's just most people don't work in, in, in downtown LA, and so they just drive. Um, conversely, if nearly everyone drives, then downtown LA is not the best location to locate a. Look, I said locate. It's not the best location to site a business because um, there's a lot of traffic there. So you want to site your business in a place where there's less. Uh, traffic. So either you will go west LA if you only care about accessibility to management, or you will go in a random, not center of anything. If it's maybe not a big, if it's on Nakatomi Plaza. So Nakatomi Plaza from the Die Hard film is said to be in Century City. Um, if it's something that's not 
the big uh, the the um, office skyscraper of a large corporation, um, and it's a small operation. You will just go to a randomly selected location in wherever. Um, now schools, the thing is, their locations again, they're pretty random. Um, now, so so so, what do you do with it? So again, if it's something that that draws citywide, you probably want it to be at least somewhat central. It doesn't have to probably not very center because a very center it's going to be accompanied by big office buildings and such. But something near center um, is not bad. Again, Brooklyn Tech is downtown Brooklyn. Um, it's a good it's a good example. Uh, and um, so th that's how you want to think about schools and and how to get there for things that draw citywide. Again, they're by definition, very few of these things. Um, Singapore, so, no, this, this is before Milton Friedman. This is um, Toryism. This is um, old Tories, not uh, new right Tories. So, yeah. Would it be fair to say that plain old local schools should be arranged around outlying stations? Uh, yes, exactly. So, if it is a place, so, so let's talk about, so, so, so now that I'm not talking about how to run the transport system. And the reason is that the transport system can only work with what it's being given. So in Berlin, it's very easy because in Berlin, the schools are all over the city. Um, it's not gonna be the most pleasant thing in the world to get between two randomly selected points by train. Um, but first of all, it's doable. Second, um, people can select schools that are closer to where they to where they are if they're not very specialized um third at least the schools that i am finding on google they tend to not be quite random they tend to be more in the ring now it's possible it's just a google artifact again i cannot find maps of this um it's infuriating um so again so i'm working with what i'm ha what, what i have but i think like the sport the, the specialized school for sport is near the ring, for example, so easier to get to. And um, <clears throat> and so the upshot is that um, even things that are randomly selected, but, but not fully random, so they may, might get close to a ring station or an U-Bahn station that's within the ring, um, it's definitely viable. And um, in a shorter, di at shorter distance, um, you have alternatives. And so what I mean by you have alternatives, a shorter distance between, I mean, travel between, let's look at Kreuzberg and Neukölln. Um, so I don't mean Neukölln, the um, borough which goes as far, which I mean, this is technically called in the borough of Neukölln and so is Rudo. So I, I mean Neukölln, the neighborhood, which only goes slightly past the ring. Um, so this area, Let's also throw an alt tab tool here. And then Kreuzberg is this. I don't remember the exact boundary. But so this area. If you are going from between two randomly selected points, if they're kind of far from each other, you will take U7 or U8 or, or you will switch, right? So uh, I used to live here. Um, even to Helmand Platz, I would take U7. Um, to uh, mailing it down for, for the bookstore, I would just take u7 all the way um i could do u7 to ua to get to Kotbus, to get to goti to, to Kotbus at all. um things that are not quite on the line on the network for example this entire area of the neighborhood um you could do bye bye this is a place uh oh i see what you mean yeah um no but i'm saying the outlying station specifically is the interesting part um is that the, uh, so between, I don't know, Zonen, this random point on Zonenale and the place it's kind of too far from Koti, like I'm here, uh, to, to go, this like, go, it's a park. You could bike. Um, this is actually a decent route to bike. I mean, Zonenale is not especially bike friendly, but, um, <clears throat> but something that, this is a place where biking on the margin could work. So it's something where specifically, the, the point is that it's, um, trips where you don't have any structure. Remember, bikes are private transport. Bikes are not the same as public transport. They can work well together. Neither of them is a car, which is very nice. A train will not run me over unless I'm trying to 
get myself killed. A bike. I've never actually been run over. I mean, I've also never been run over by a car. But the point is that a bike weighs fifteen kilograms, and a car weighs fifteen hundred kilograms, and is also faster. So the danger is different. Um, and uh, the um, but they don't have the same power. I actually have a, a video on this that you can go on my YouTube channel. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, just scroll backward. Uh, and I, I talked about this difference between travel by bike and travel by public transport. So, and, and the point is that a good situation in which you would need uh, something to fill in the gaps in public transport is if you have a school commute that's, let's say, two, three, four kilometers, it's not really congruent to the, um, to the city rail network which again it might be me living living in Neukölln and going to Koti or to Mellingdam but um but the schools could be wherever um that is actually a good um use case for a bike um so people do bike to school that's uh rather common in places with decent public transport uh, it's something actually uh it's, it's something that um, I think Connor said and I don't remember if he said i think maybe connor no i remember connor, connor said that on uh uh on fetty on, on mastodon not here that um in the netherlands uh um people cycle but when public transport is available they take public transport um so in this case cycling is is a good mode of the gaps um but the point is that it's not really a matter of transport policy okay there's yeah berlin could choose a transport policy that makes it easier to get to school by modes other than the car. Um, what does this mean? Well, uh, it means building more U-Bahn lines to places that are not on the U-Bahn. That's the most important. So, Mackishas Fiatel, the place that the Greens ignore because it's outside the ring, and if you're outside the ring, rather as, uh, if you're, I won't say if you're outside the ring, then you're not a real person to the Greens, but I think at this point enough Greens are gentrifying Lichtenberg that, uh, and while opposing gentrification, uh, that they are aware that that exists, but Mackishas Fiota, these people don't deserve trains. What are we talking about? Maybe a tram? Uh, um, so yeah, you want to expand the Uban a little bit, but that's not for schools. This is just generally good public transport. And I imagine in Mackishas Fiota, um, it's a purpose-built neighborhood. They're I, I expect that there should be a school here. I don't actually know it. I believe that uh, the places I've spent more um, time being a tourist in, um, uh, Gropiusstadt, um, does have schools within the project. Uh, so people don't even need to travel very far for that. Um, and again, if, if they're going to a school outside the neighborhood, then yes. But... Um, the, but that's not the main reason to build U8 to Mackish's Fiat. But, but the point is that it's things that are very much on the margin. So again, doing some really important urban expansion projects. Uh, um, building more cycle paths. And this is the thing that um, Mayor Wegener genuinely sucks about. Um, just some Berlin news for people who don't know them, uh, who, who don't know what's going on here. Um, the... Uh, so Tzedeu just announced that they are going to uh, do a halt and do a review of every cycling project if it takes any, uh, uh, if it, oh right, no, I cannot click links here, if it takes cars. And this got, uh, and in the media they even portrayed it as if, if a single parking spot would be lost. It's not that extreme, but it's, I think they said uh, 50 parking, or something like maybe 50 parking spots over a half kilometer would be enough to kill the bike lane. Uh, and, um, and there's been a lot of complaint about this by people who are also trying to explain to me why Mackish Fiatil does not deserve trains. Um, and um, so, and this is again, to be very clear, against the coalition agreement and SPD members are complaining that Tzedu has announced this without consulting with their coalition partners. Now, are the... And now is SPD going to respond to this by saying, okay, we're passing no confidence and going back to red or green? No, they're not. But, I mean, 
they're upset. I mean, wait, why are you showing me this? Oh, versus buses, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes more sense. It's actually interesting that the, the, that the students are um, this very sensitive. Um, what's and wait? This is for all trips, right? The fifty-six percent of trips in Eindhoven are, are cars, right? Um, and then yeah, no, d d the Netherlands is just not very good at public transport. Um, with the ex with a specific exception of intercity rail, where they are probably the second best in Europe for the Swiss. Um, yeah, all trips. Yeah, okay, so um. At least in Germany, the way it works is that um, public transport is the strongest for work trips and the second strongest for school trips. <coughs> and then discretionary trips, the topic of our previous video, uh, are the weakest thing for public transport because they just don't agglomerate at all. Now, bear in mind, school trips don't agglomerate either, as the point that I'm making. But um, children don't own cars. Um, Parents could chauffeur them, but why would the parent be a chauffeur when the child can just cycle for 15 minutes and be at school or for 20 minutes and be at school? Um, and so, or, or walk 20 to 30 minutes or take the train for 20 to 30 minutes, depending on exact locations. Um, so anyway, I was trying to dump on Kai Wagner and yeeting all CDU thought from Germany ever would make things better in the sense of having more bike lanes. But all of this is on the margin. Um, the real policy when it comes to getting people to take non-car modes of transport to school is not about transport policy. It's about where the schools are. Um, now, this is sometimes mirrored in other cases. Um, it is useful to plan um, public transport and zoning together in order to uh, affect uh, denser cities with stronger central business districts. Um, but I would say that but these are two, again, related policies. So you can improve the public transportation system without doing big changes to the zoning, and that will by itself make things better. Um, I will actually point out that in uh, that Australian cities don't have very strong central business districts, but still have decent model splits um and uh so you could you can and, and remember the strong central business district is not prior to the strong public transport network they reinforce each other um with schools i don't think such a thing is really viable like i, I can't think of a policy that in a place let's, let's go back to the united states that in an american suburb or secondary city that is being turned into a suburb that would make the schools are more transit oriented um, without moving the schools. It's important for the schools to be in city center wherever there is a city center. And, and okay, because I'm toggling back and forth between cities of very different classes, when I say city center, I should probably say town center. So I don't mean New York or Berlin, not in this case. I mean Fitchburg. Fitchburg is not a large city. I think it's 80,000 people or something like that. It might be 100,000 people. <laughs> Forty thousand people, forty-two thousand people. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah. So the thing is, in Fitchburg, again, Fitchburg is not historically a suburb. You can even see the land use in Fitchburg and how it contrasts with other towns um, in Massachusetts. Um, side note: they're never called townships; they're called towns. If you call them townships, it's because you've read um, a British translation of Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, they've, again, they've literally never been called townships. The, co the correct word for this in American English is town. Um, Alexis, de Tocqueville, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville was writing in French. He said commune. British translations rendered that not as the as how it's actually called in English, which is town, but it's township. So um, a, a town like, I don't know, Sudbury, or Acton, actually. Acton has a 
So the busiest station on the Fitchburg line is not actually Fitchburg um, or Brandeis. It's actually South Acton. But look at this. This is not a town with... I mean, yeah, it's a town like was found to be a town, but it was a village. Um, it never had real independent urban existence, whereas a place like um, Fitchburg very clearly does have that history. Again, Lowell, Lawrence... Um, Lynn, Salem, uh, Newburyport, uh, Framingham, Worcester, um, Plymouth, of course, um, very famous, um, Barnstable, um, and um, and so in a place like this, there's a town, first of all, there's a town center. Uh, you can that you can walk around. Um, and there are things that you can do there. Um, now, over time, the town center... Yeah, no, it's New England. Everything is named after English places. I mean, they have Norfolk and Southern and Suffolk counties in Massachusetts um, named after their, the British ones without any interest in geography. So uh, Suffolk County is Boston, and uh, is Boston, Revere, Chelsea... And Winthrop. So this is Suffolk County. Then there's Norfolk County, which is has Brooklyn as an exclave, and then this is Norfolk County. Yes, Norfolk County is south of Suffolk County. Um, feel free to mock Americans over their sense of direction. Uh, so, um, at any rate, in Fitchburg, there is a town center. Now, the town center is getting weaker over time. Why is it getting weaker over time? Well, it's not very good for public transport because what's the public transport? It's a commuter train that is designed exclusively as a park and ride for nine to five commuters to Boston. Now, yes, at Transit Matters, we are trying to change that um, as part of the regional rail project, but this is not even priority two, unfortunately. Priority one is Providence, Fairmount, and Eastern lines. There are some lines that we're trying to make into a priority two, like the Western line. This is not even there. Um, and the governor seems uninterested. And so, yeah, this is not usable public transport. Um, and there's a bus system, but the bus system in Massachusetts towns that are not... I shouldn't say Massachusetts towns that are not Boston, because I think Cambridge is a town that's not Boston, it's a city that's not Boston. But so in, in Massachusetts agglomerations that are not the Boston built-up area, they have something called RTAs, regional, trans uh, regional transit authorities, where essentially the, tr the bus these are buses that are transportation of last resort. They're designed for very poor people. Um, they meander all over. Um, they often pulse in city center, but they come hourly or even worse than hourly. They stop running at 8 or 9 at night, um, serving malls that close at 10 at night for the retail workers. And uh, they are, and they, they do not coordinate with the trains. So essentially, the, this is a soup kitchen on a bus. Um, and of course, as soon as it's a soup kitchen, if you try any to propose any change, people will start saying, "But what about the poor people?" When you suggest that the soup kitchen have food that is edible. Um, so in Fitchburg, there's no real strength to the town center. Um, everyone owns a car, unless they're extremely poor. And if you're extremely poor, probably you're not the main market for, let's say, a shopping mall. Shopping malls target people who have... I mean, they probably don't target very rich people, um, random shopping malls in a, in a random suburb, but they target people with purchase power, and people with purchase power have cars. And, uh, um, and what then? Well, they uh, so the, so retail would prefer not to locate here because here there might be because here um, there's still a little bit of traffic. I mean, not real traffic, not not real city traffic or real city parking difficulties, but harder than if you um, move development to um, this place, for example. This is for the school, and the same is going to be for shopping malls. So stuff will naturally move out of city center. Uh, if there isn't any counter any kind of countervailing trend, the countervailing trend is quality of transit. As I said, um, 
city centers and public transit build up on each other and they're and, and if they're weak they weaken each other it's in a loop schools however are just downstream uh, transportation to schools is downstream of the choice of where to place the school and this is not a private choice but a public choice these are public schools the united states barely has private schools and the private schools that exist um they tend to be snooty very snooty urban maybe very rich suburban private schools uh and uh or maybe some church schools um but that's i think mostly in the south where the where essentially they're just for racial segregation and we're not talking about the south we're talking about massachusetts massachusetts does not need um to go private school to have the desired level of racial segregation um racial segregation occurs in massachusetts through these little districts that are town side um and uh so the school it was a public choice to move the, and i don't mean in the sense of public choice here i mean it was a choice by the public sector in the town to move the school here the school should have been staying should have stayed and it should ideally be moved back to town to the city center um to town center where the city buses could be used as school buses um <clears throat> i mean this, the buses are not used for nine to five commuters because if you're poor enough to be on a bus in fitchburg you're not a nine to five commuter you're probably a retail worker retail jobs start late and end late so essentially this means that so this actually in general the reason you you want to centralize more and more and different more and more different things in city center is that you have different is you have more kind of trips with different peaks all using the same system instead of having the inefficiency of having to split between regular buses and school buses you have them be the same fleet where the peak of people going to school is different from the peak of people going to work now i will caveat this which is the peak of people going to school um unless you're torturing kids with 7 a.m. start times, a more normal start time is between 8 and 8.30. And that is a start time where uh, if parents, uh, where um, actually parents might draw, um, ride the bus with the kid and then change to a train. Um, so the train, so, so the peak of people connecting to the train, so this is now um, exclusively a park and ride, but it's not that hard to write a timetable where the trains and the buses are coordinated. Um, let's say every half hour or maybe every 15 minutes, even if it's rush hour. Um, so um, the peak for these trips, for these connections, is for people, uh, is based not on where people work around the, the center of Fitchburg, which is not a strong job center, but around people changing to a train to work at an actually strong job center that is to say boston and cambridge this is i don't remember how much it takes today i think it's an hour and a half but with better regional rail service it would be about an hour and change so um the peak would be entering boston around uh nine um and so entering center of fitchburg a little before eight so maybe seven thirty to eight um and um, that would be actually pretty close to the school peak, which I don't think it's that much of a problem, especially if the if it's not a high school but a middle school, because then parents might still want to go with the kid. And uh, and of course, if the parents choose to drive and there's still parking, then they can drop the kid off to, uh, to drop the kid off at school on their way to the park and ride. Um, so again, use the same transportation system and co-locate. Use the strength of city center. This is a question of um, transit-oriented development. This is not a question of transport policy, not at this scale. There's nothing that can be done in Massachusetts to serve this location by any mode other than a car. Um, however, it is possible to move this back here. Um, so this is the situation in um, places that are not uh, big cities, which Fitchburg is not. Now, in places that are big cities, uh, I said I was going to talk about New York and Vancouver. In New York, students get metro cards, um, at least 
when friends of mine were going to high school, which was 15 years ago, it was not in unlimited, but you were allowed three swipes a day. So home to school, school to something, something to home. Um, it's rather stupid, just give them unlimited. Um, stop being cheap. Now in Vancouver, um, I know that at UBC, um, um, a student card counts as a unlimited transit pass. Um, I mean, uni pays translink for this. But, um, so this is something that facilitates um, a lot of public transport usage to UBC. Now, universities are different from primary and secondary schools because they are far bigger. Whereas primary and secondary schools do not agglomerate very much, universities are the exact opposite. They do agglomerate. Moreover, they agglomerate with um, populations that are unlikely to be owning a car because they're students. Um, and if people live nearby, which is not common in Canada, but is common in the United States, they might even form a little bit of a bubble. Um, and, uh, and in this bubble, it's very easy to use non-motorized forms of transportation. And this is why um, if you want to look at a place where there's a high um, bike um, model split, you generally want to look at a university town. Um, I think in Europe, the, the highest bike model splits are still all Dutch. Um, I do not know whether in the Netherlands, a place like Delft or Leiden is going to have an unusually high bike model split. But um, I think in Belgium, the highest is actually in Ghent. Um, and, in, and in Germany, in a place like Göttingen, um, it is also rather high and, and, and so on. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, Phillips Exeter. I mean, yeah, Phillips and uh, um, Phillips Exeter and and uh, no, not uh, Phillips Exeter. Exeter is the other one. Is Andover. Um. Yeah, exactly, and uh, and of course, um, uh, and of course, Oxbridge within Britain. Um, I think York is maybe also rather good for this by you know northern English standards. Yeah, it's very common for students. Uh, and um, um, and and that also becomes and that's also important for professors because the professors um, well, think about the professors for a sec. A professor works at the university, but the professor um, and the professor expects to be working at that university over a long time. Um, which means that, the, that it's okay for the professor. So it means that academics can orient their commute lives based on getting to the uni. And the uni will also have a lot of cultural amenities. Um, I mean, in I, I know this in New Haven, just because I have family there, and I, I would take the train up and see, where I think they... At, they they had Paul fucking Jamati, um, at their theater at one of their theater shows. I mean, talking about he's like a Hollywood actor. I mean, he's not like the bigot. I mean, he's not Brad Pitt or anything, but he's a very solid Hollywood actor and like um films with like serious budgets. Um, and they got and they got him to uh, uh and they got him to act in one of their theater productions. This this is how like this is how high end. Uh, New Haven uh, um, cultural amenities are and, and the result is that and because these center around the university um, this means that there is this kind of centralization of the non-work, non-school activities that I was talking about last time um, and yes, in, in such a circumstance uh, it's very easy to have a high non-car model split, something which could be a bike or could be a train um, it, it depends on where the professor uh, lives and so um, but so again universities are very different because universities are huge um, now in some places like the United States and Britain there's a tendency actually not Britain it's more than the United States there's a tendency to have little colleges and really out of the way places um, I want to say in Britain but in Britain it's, it's not actually true I mean yes Oxbridge, uh, Oxford and Cambridge are not the largest cities in Britain, right? I mean, London exists, Birmingham, Manchester, uh, Liverpool, and so on. And, and, and even in the Middle Ages, Oxford and Cambridge might have been top 10, but they were not top 5, right? Because the top, 
I thought the pre-modern top cities I mean, were always it was always London and then what Norwich, York, Bristol maybe. Um, but I mean, Oxford to Cambridge existed as a city as a place. Um, so maybe you should not slag on Britain as much. Say England actually. This is specifically England right? because the Scottish unis are more urban maybe. Um, but um, the. But in the United States, it just doesn't seem to have lots of little colleges in very out of the way places, um, and I don't mean even out of the way in the sense that New Haven is just not as important a city as it used to be. I mean, uh, have you seen where Wellesley is? Or um, so, uh, so I mean, colleges specifically. It's a, it's a. Uh, I want to say it's a New England thing, but I mean, the snootiest liberal arts college in California. Or the entire Western United States, Pomona is yes, it's a little built-up area of Los Angeles, but it's in fucking Pomona. Um, Wellesley, there's barely even anything urban here. Um, so again, this is an American specialty of uh, putting education far from the city. Uh, yeah, sounds about right. Except the poshest sent Okay, yeah, the Scot. I know a bunch of Scottish people. They're not posh at all. Um. And so anyway, Canada does not have that issue. Canada has giant public unis. Where um, I think in Toronto, the saying is that the University of Toronto, you're less than just a number. Uh, UBC is about that. Uh, is about that large and about that red tape ridden. Uh. It also agglomerates, and they, for some reason, pick the most out of the way location in Metro Vancouver. In, in, maybe not in, in in Metro Vancouver because the most out of the way location in Metro Vancouver is he, is like White Rock. But I mean, the most out of the way location in Vancouver for it. But this out of the way location, by virtue of having UBC, is not actually out of the way, and it's actually a very strong anchor um, to the point that several of the cities. Lar- um, busiest buses, including the single busiest bus bus in North America, the Nightman B, are east west buses that go to UBC. Um, so again, unis are different. Um, but school, but, but primary and secondary schools don't agglomerate that way. Um, New York actually has a typically large um, high schools. Brooklyn Tech is the largest high school in New York City. I don't remember. There's a chance it's the largest high school by enrollment per year in the United States. It is about 5,000, maybe 5.4 thousand over four years. So about 1.3 thousand kids a year, which is basically unheard of. I mean, I mean, Stuyvesant is, I think, 900 a year. And I think Stuyvesant and Bronx are about 800, 900, 1,000 a year. And even these are very high numbers. Um, Normally, it's much less. The, the school that I was showing to you where I went in Tel Aviv, I think at the time, was 200 per year. Um, and that was considered large. And so... Or maybe a bit more than 200 per year, I don't remember. But um, but um, so, so the point is that schools just don't agglomerate as much. Um, so what you do is you attempt to place them within an urban fabric where you can use the normal city public transport network. They do run more buses at rush hour on school days. So um, when you look at a bus timetable in Vancouver, um, they will have different uh, timetables you know, for, for uh, weekdays and weekends. But for week, uh, but on the weekday timetable, they will show some extra trips uh, that they say are only on school days. Uh, they're, these are not school trips. These are not school buses. These are buses that go back and forth on Broadway or Fourth Ave or whatever. Um, but um, are uh, for the higher demand that you get on school days, and uh, and that works, I think. Um, but that's again, it's not really transport policy. And doing doing a little bit of fidgeting, that's not really transport policy. It's having enough of a transit city in general that the bu- that the schools can actually be serviced this way. Um, and again, something you can do when you have a dense city like New York or even Vancouver. Vancouver is a much less dense city than New York. Um, Vancouver has a very strong city center, uh, but um, <coughs> I can't exactly compare it with New York. I don't have granular enough Canadian data, and at any rate, Vancouver is a much smaller city than New York, and 
metrics that I like using, like share of metro area jobs that are within the central 100 square kilometers are very degressive in metro area size. Um, but Vancouver very clearly does have a lot of job centralization around downtown Vancouver and to some extent around Central Border around here. Um, and that does make it easier to have a functional bus system connecting with SkyTrain that people will voluntarily take it to school. Um, Scots are an aristocratic caste in modern Britain. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so the... Um, so, so this is essentially what you do with schools. You, again, you need to have, and it, maybe this is a companion to what I was saying in the last video about uh, public transport for air trips um, and personal trips. Um, you want a strong enough transit network in general, and then, um, and then the errand trips will just, to some extent, rearrange themselves. I and mean, you can do things like improve span, um, improve transfers, um, but at the end of the day, when you have a strong skeleton of a transit system, probably for some kind of joint housing and transportation and work um, development plan. Uh, then you're making city center stronger and therefore social events will locate there. Now with schools, again, it's not, now schools are not, the locations of schools are not chosen by the by any kind of free market mechanism. Again, very little private education in the countries that we're talking about, the US, Canada, Germany. Um, maybe there might, be, uh, there might be a lot of localism there. So it's decisions that are not by the state or anything like that, but it's not like market actors. It's not like building, it's not like who builds it. It's not like where shopping malls are being built. Um, it's where schools are being built. And so you want to make sure that the schools are built within the urban fabric, wherever it is viable. Um, so if you have neighbor, so if you have very local um, draws for the schools, um, probably also means the schools are usually, I think, a little smaller in that case. Then, yeah, the schools are going to be everywhere. Um, but they can still. But if you have neighborhood centers, you might still want to put the school there. Now, let's not exaggerate. Okay, so what? It, so certainly in in central areas, I don't think it's terribly important. So what I mean by central areas in Kreuz, so Kreuzberg has centers, right? I mean, I mean, not all locations in Kreuzberg are equally central. So I would say that the centers of Kreuzberg are the maybe more uh, the maybe more bourgeois part is Mellingham and the area that was historically maybe rougher and more working class but at this point is gentrified a lot is Koti um and so you don't need to have the schools here or here right? you can have the schools here I think I think I, whenever I walk to Koti I pass by a school things aren't here okay so here, 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 here. These are okay locations here. I think there's some um, schools that are in the, maybe not at school, maybe it's a kindergarten or something. Uh, that's in this, that's somewhere within this project that I, I uh, it was where I was voting on the referendum, on the climate referendum. It took me a while to find where I was voting. Then there was, was very fast in and out because the turnout was shut. Uh, and um, so, so I don't mean neighborhood center in a place that's very dense. Um, and the same in the place like I know further sign. Right? In further sign, there are neighborhood centers. I think the this point the most important is uh, Vashavastasa. You don't need to be within walking distance of Vashavastasa. That's ridiculous uh, for a school. I mean, maybe there should be a school here, but there should be schools all over. But in a place that's less dense. So we were talking about reparations. No, just no. Um, but in a place that's less dense, I want to say maybe Lichtenberg, but I'm not very familiar with Lichtenberg. Um, uh, but certainly in much more suburban areas, it's much more useful to do so. And this is where I was giving the example of uh, Gropiusstadt. So in Gropiusstadt, um, there is a very sharp density gradient. You can literally see on... No, I don't want to um, do a hardware scan. Um, you can literally see big buildings. Speaking of school, my 
computer is upset that it is old enough to have finished first grade and has not had education. Um, so big buildings, small buildings, small buildings, small buildings. A little bit of a neighborhood center, small buildings. Um, so yeah, you want the schools to be near the big buildings. That is part of a structure of density. Um, it's what you do when you have a master planned community. And this is, as far as they can tell, what they've done. So the sports facilities, uh, the, the schools, the, the supermarket, like oh, um, the library, they're all, uh, the, the shopping malls here, um, they're all right on top of the Uban stations that are designated as neighborhood centers. Um, people slag on modernist planning a lot, but there are things that did well. So this is partly a library. This is a bunch of offices. I think the I think this is the supermarket. And if I'm wrong, then the supermarket is part of this. No, this is a supermarket. I think. Um, this is additional read. Um, and uh, the and so you want so if you have a large density gradient, which you which Colopio Strat does, you want to make sure the schools are in the dense part. Um, which again they did. Again, the uh, modernist planners may have thought that cars were good and, and that there should be a lot of space between the buildings, but they were not stupid people. Um, and, and I imagine in a place like Vanze, I have no idea where the schools in Vanze are. Um, I imagine you would want the school at least somewhere near the train station, or maybe somewhere near a, the neighborhood center, which is very much not where the train station is. Um, Vanze is not Gropiusstadt. Vanze is wealthy as all hell. Uh, I mean, the kids are not driving because people here can't, because kids don't drive. But this is actually a place where parents might chauffeur, I'm not sure. Um, but this is a place where you probably want to have a school either near the train station or I imagine this is a neighbor, this is a neighborhood center. Um, it's also where the, um, uh, where the football pitch is. This is a football pitch, right? No, this is a football pitch. What is this then? What sport is played here? Again, this is the, the, the football pitch. So I imagine school, but I do not actually know. Farmers are not the secret American nobility. Farmers are, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think French Canadians are, uh, are an aristocracy. They're just rock flowers. Um, I mean, not all of them, but I mean, the, the, the sort of racism in Quebec. Somehow, Vancouver, which is the most explicitly racist place that I have um, lived in, somehow more than Tel Aviv and Singapore. And yes, I'm aware that Tel Aviv and Singapore have more racial discrimination. In Vancouver, there's just more people talking to me about whatever they hate about whichever racial minority pissed them off the most. And even there, the worst I've heard was from a Quebecois. Um, oh, yeah, f 10 to 15, yeah, 5, 10, 15 minutes is fine. Um, the problem is it adds up if it's a short trip because for a long trip, yeah, I take the train and then walk five minutes is fine. But if it's a short trip, then that adds up. It was fine. Um... Yeah, but anyway, so the um, so this is when you have a very large density gradient, which you were generally well outside the central parts of the city. Now, in the central parts of the city, in a European city, there will just not be much of a density gradient. This is a problem of European commercial development. European urbanists hate the idea of commerce. Um, one of the reasons that they stop... So, so as someone who pretty openly hates the United States on many things, there's a reason they kind of stopped using the kind of most traditional European formulation of Americans are stupid. Um, it's for a lot of reasons, because for, first of all, it's a lot more nuanced and the second, but the second, more importantly, more importantly, European denigration of Americans is stupid. I thought it was about monolingualism or about not being able to find places on a map. It really isn't about either of these things. It's about the fact that very specifically in the United States, communism is not taken intellectually seriously. Um, it, the, the European who says that Amer oh, Americans are so stupid they don't get X is someone who's specifically complaining that in the United States you cannot be openly Marxist and be taken seriously and in Western Europe regrettably in many places including humanities, academia, you can 
Um, now, for those of us who know in which direction people fled as the wall was crumbling down, um, it, it's, imp- it's important to understand this because all, quite a lot of the people here do urbanism um, have not internalized in which direction the wall fell. And so they keep talking about, they, they keep making about 3 million complaints about capitalism, some of which are things that are good. The other things are things that are not even the fault of capitalism, but the fault of other things. And and the upshot is that um, things that are very obvi- very obviously look like places where you, one goes to make money are denigrated within European urbanism, and there and this is and, and this leads first of all to the belief that Europe is more moral than the United States because we have less commercial city centers. Now, in the real world. Our city centers are more commercial than those of the United States, with the exception of that of New York. Um, yes, there are tall buildings in downtown Atlanta, and there aren't buildings approaching that size in the center of Berlin. But as a, we'll never tire of reminding both Americans and Europeans, let's look not at the center of Atlanta, but at what happens to subway stops east and west of the center of Atlanta. So in Atlanta, they have tall buildings within city center. Tall buildings, very uh, some of them are very tall. So um, what's the altitude? 317. Atlanta is not a coastal city. In fact, it lies on the ridge of the uh, uh, eastern continental divide between the Mississippi uh, watershed and the Atlantic watershed. I mean, it's at this point, it's not Appalachians, but you continue on the ridge north and you get the Appalachians. So, remember 317 ish is the is ground level, more or less. This is 484. So, this is a building of uh, 170, 160 something meters. Yeah, taller than. So. I don't think it's taller than anything in Germany. I think it's taller than anything in Germany outside Frankfurt. And of course, Frankfurt gets a lot of hate for having tall buildings. What is this? This is 130, 528. Yeah, this is 200. This might actually be taller than every single German building. Um, The same, these, same, yeah. And I'm not, and I don't even know where the tallest buildings in Atlanta are. I'm just literally doing Google Earth for them. This might be the tallest. Yeah. Um, so if you think of this as a commercial, of a strong commercial city center and of Berlin as something much slower paced, congratulations, you are wrong. Because, you see, this is downtown Atlanta. It's a Petrie. Um, no, it's only Petrie. Sorry. It's five points. Petrie is here. It's five points. And now let's go to subway stops east. Can you see how city center this is? Uh, I guess this is a condo, okay, four-story condo, which uh, is shorter than most things in Berlin. Okay, they, they've built a few condos, but this is not city center. The condos, parking, yeah, and a little bit of building there, but mostly parking, a little bit of, does this even use it to park? Maybe. This, this looks like a cemetery, which is exactly the uh, land use I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of transit-oriented development. Um, I oppose racism. I oppose speciesism. I strongly believe that um, transit is not just for humans, um, but you also should have um, zombies and ghouls and vampires. Um, and, and if you're and, and you should ask yourself for whom are you building the city and if the city and, and if transit oriented development does not have room for um, the undead in it, then are we really building the right cities for everyone? Um, so yeah, this is the human section and this is the uh, zombie section. So I, I do appreciate that Atlanta is the city too busy to hate. Well, too busy to hate the undead. Maybe it's not too busy to hate black people, but um, the uh, but but I do but I do appreciate that um, the transit-oriented development here, again, 
two subway stops from city center accommodate uh, everyone. And on the other side, two subway stops west of uh, the center, it's here. And yeah, there's this. And then look here. It is a bunch of townhouses. Um, yeah, two subway. Yeah, so when this is why I never take urbanists seriously when they think that American cities are overdeveloped or that there's too much stuff in city center compared with Europe. It's the exact opposite. Again, New York is different. New York also has a metro area transit model split of about 30%, which beats, I don't think it's beat most of Europe. I mean, yeah, it beats Europe, but it beats, but Europe is mostly not big cities. It does not beat the biggest European cities. It's, it, Paris is better, Berlin is better, Madrid is better, Barcelona is better, um, Vienna is better, Stockholm is better, Praga is better. I think, I don't know about uh, München, Zuri is about the same as New York City. Zuri is about 1.7 million people in the metro area, New York City, 22 million. Um, but, the, but the point is that um, the mockery of Americans for driving everywhere is specifically places that have weak city centers. Now, evidently, we have strong city centers in Europe without uh, a lot of skyscrapers because we keep building commercial things that are not, um, not just at city center, but also a couple subway stops out. That said, <coughs> yeah, in London, there's, uh, yeah, don't forget that the uh, king is, uh, that the king has uh, strong opinions on this. Uh, very kind of consumption urbanism, so cars are bad, but also tall buildings are bad. Yes. Um, I don't actually know if they think any better of Glasgow and uh, and Edinburgh. But yeah, so the point is that you do want to have a strong city center. Um, now, I'm pointing out that in Europe, there's very little density gradient within the city center. Um, this is something that Europe should work on. There should be taller buildings here. Thankfully, there are building a tall building here. It's actually emerging enough that you can... It's the Amazon Tower. You can see it. Um, there's been a lot of opposition to it by people who think that it's okay not to have jobs. And um, the um, so there is a bit of a gradient, but usually when there's a gradient, it's something that's very high-end office towers. Again, this is Amazon. Amazon has money. And the point is that you probably don't want to co-locate when the gradient comes from just office towers. Now, if the gradient comes from neighborhood centers, town centers, community centers, then yeah, schools are should co-locate. So the school, I do not know which is the school building in Gropiostadt. I imagine, what is this? Is this multi, yeah, this is a football pitch. And also a running track. I imagine the school would be around here. Um, so this is kind of co-located, not literally at the center. It could, this is close enough. Um, now within city center, if you do have a gradient, then, which again, Berlin doesn't, but, or kind of doesn't, but if you do have a gradient, you don't need to locate at the very center. You can, you probably, you want locations that are a little bit cheaper. Um, and again, Brooklyn Tech is actually not a bad location because downtown Brooklyn is a place that's very well served by the trains, uh, for how strong it is as a, uh, job center essentially it's been in decline for know, 100 years so yeah brooklyn tech is just outside the commercial center of downtown brooklyn which is again it's a good place for such a place if for, for, for a school that draws citywide um the the name bronx and bronx lines means that you can't easily move it to queens without breaking things um but somewhere near the jobs of long island city is also a good um, location probably not at the i mean you don't want to go at queen's plaza or queensborough plaza just because you do want because this is something where there are there are higher uses um but if you're even here or something like that then yeah go ahead um i mean this is i mean i, I keep talking about this area a lot because um when i visit the city this is where i stay um because the hotels here are very close to the center and they're not expensive to the point that i could 
start even doing hotel reviews, like Long Island City three star hotel reviews. By a long way, I mean not not my strongest, not my unique selling point as a writer, but it is something that I could do. Oh yeah, S and P is an MB, sure. I mean. Oh yeah, yeah, fair. But that's not S and P. That's every party in Geffa. I mean, again, let's talk about the Green Party. Actually, let's not talk about the Green Party. Like it, it used to be the talking about Olaf Scholz upset me, and at this point, talking about Robert Habeck upsets me. Um, whereas Olaf Scholz, yeah, he lies, but he, at the end of the day, Kitties did go to Ukraine. I mean, it did take close to a year for him to ascend, but. The kiddies are in Ukraine, um, and so you. So when you have a gradient again, because of a city center, New York is a very good example of this. Vancouver is, by the way, not actually a really good example of the, of this gradient. Vancouver. So Vancouver is kind of American style or, or North American. Let's call it North American style in that um, there is a, a very sharp gradient between tall buildings and single family housing. Um, at this point, you think it's not literal single family. You think there's a basement. Not a basement, um, an accessory dwelling, like a garage granny flat. But uh, let's compare the density here. Again, randomly chosen parts of Vancouver with the density. Let me see if I can. It's not the, no, I need main. Yeah, the here, for example. This is. You might be able to tell by the architecture, not historic buildings. These are buildings that were put there right on top of the uh, sky ring of Main Street Science World. So very large density gradient. So in this case, you want to have the schools probably close to the high density part um, when you can. Um, but in city center, it's probably not as viable just because the, the land values are likely too high and um there's a kind of what's the point question there i mean maybe people who live on the west side could have something but if they were citing schools in vancouver um let's say growing so the region has a growing population the, the city is building a lot of housing um the the fastest population growth is not in the city it's in the suburbs but the city too has population growth and these people will have kids and so if vancouver to ask me alone where should we build new schools First of all, I would ask him to have to show me a map of where all the schools are because that appears to be atypically difficult to get. But again, I would look for for locations that in the Vancouver system of sh very sharp density gradients between uh, next to SkyTrain and and not next to Sky uh, and not next to SkyTrain. Uh, the uh, schools should be close to where the high density is. And again, maybe not literally there, but five minute walk max, I would say. Um, and uh, and so the, uh, but again, not in the sense of a commercial city center. So I, I don't think that they should be trying to put high schools or anything like that right on top of Van City Center or anything like that. Not Van City Center, Van City Hall. Um, or, or, or downtown Vancouver, but again, the other neighborhood centers, to the extent they exist. Um, now, in an area that, again, just does not have much of a gradient, like let's say the west side, um, the west side does not have much of a density gradient. Um, the, the west side of Vancouver, just as a side note, the east side of Vancouver is called East Vancouver. The west side is never called West Vancouver because West Vancouver is a suburb of a suburb. The, sub the main suburb is called North Van and is um, across the across the inland with a, with a ferry. I think this is the number two ferry and ridership in North America after the Staten Island Ferry. And then West Van is a suburb of the suburb. Uh, very low density. Um, and um, but the west, the denser parts of the west, I don't have that much of a gradient. I think the gradient is currently developing because of the um, indigenous reservation. There's this area, I never remember which one, where somehow because of some weird gap in the in treaties with um, you know, with the, with the Indian treaties, 
uh, the, the the white Canadians neglected to fully ethnically cleanse the, the indigenous people from some kind of sliver here. Uh, and I think it's this one, maybe. Um, because uh, and it's, uh, there was some kind of session that somehow fell under a federal rather than a, uh, than a provincial law. And um, long story short, uh, somehow there's indigenous sovereignty over, I think it would be this area or this area. So the um, tribe in question, instead, uh, um, the, so the tribe in question realized that maybe they and the rest of the city need affordable housing. So they're just building tall buildings without having to... Uh, so, the, so they're building tall buildings without having to explain themselves uh, to neighborhood NIMBYs. It's really sweet. The neighborhood NIMBYs are losing their minds over tall buildings in this area. So maybe here uh, that's going to be a um, density gradient. But this is already a pretty dense area. It's just that, the, again, the density is kind of haphazard. Um, so here you would, the, you would play schools anywhere. Um, whereas... Uh, uh, so, so around Kitsilano, um, whereas in, in a place with more of a gradient, you do want it to be more centralized. Um, Fitchburg is the example I keep going to. I mean, I, I'm giving you examples right now of gradients in, I don't know what to call them, cities? I don't want to say, I mean, yeah, let's just say cities, not, not even big cities or anything like that, Vancouver and Berlin or not, um, as opposed to towns, if that makes sense. Fitzroy is not a city; it's a town. I didn't. I don't just mean legally. Legally, I mean again, forty thousand people. Um, if the density gradient is because you have a historic town center and then sprawl, the schools go here, not here. This is important again. It's so, so in the suburbs or in towns that became suburbs like Fitzroy, that's the main lesson to learn in a transit city like Berlin or New York or even Vancouver, um, if you have sub areas with residential density gradient, um, then you want the schools near the high density parts. Um, and so, 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 okay, what do I mean by gradient, right? So I mean, is flushing a residential density gradient? Maybe, I mean, there are jobs in flushing. I think flushing might at this point be the second largest job center in Queens after Long Island City. Um, I think there are more jobs in Flushing than Jamaica, maybe more than in JFK, I'm not sure. Um, so this is enough of a, this, this is also an ethnic and cultural center, of course, Flushing. So you probably want to make sure that schools are at least walkable to the subway, but it might be too difficult to find a local, I mean, okay, there's parking. This is empty, just maybe that. But, um, but you don't, but it's, Maybe less important than, than it uh, than the place like Copio Stud, if that makes sense. Um, now, of course, what do I mean schools? I mean, so again, this is an ethnic and cultural center, Flushing. Um, if the school is uh, so, it, which is kind of weird. So, if the school is very local, then yeah, it can be wherever. If the school is supposed to draw from other places, let's say it's Chinese school. Let's say in the same way that um, Berlin has the French school where you can prep for the abitur, we can choose whether to prep for abitur or bac, and you graduate fully trilingual. Um, let's say that for some reason they choose to cite a Chinese school in Flushing. Now, choose. There are schools with predominantly Chinese student bodies, and I don't just mean STI, where they teach Chinese. I mean, as a, as a, as a heritage language, in order to graduate fully bilingual students. Um, th there is bilingual education in the United States. Now, there's a lot of controversy over this and when it comes to the Spanish language because um, there's this mentality in the United States that the Spanish language is kind of poor. The, the only words that you say in Spanish are things like abuela and abuelita and not literally anything involving railway engineering. Um, but Asian immigrants are way more educated than Hispanic immigrants. Asian Americans are very... Uh, openly success it's very clear that they're very um educationally successful so there's less of a national moral panic about oh my god they don't just speak english i mean there is a moral panic about uh there's a let's say maybe anti-chinese racist moral panic but it's not about oh it's making the schools bad it's it's, it's something different 
Um, so there, there is bilingual education. So I imagine such a place would, uh, such a school would want to be uh, maybe close to it, um, the subway if they're planning on people coming um, commuting in from elsewhere. Um, you would presumably also have such schools in Chinatown. Uh, actually, I, I know of, uh, actually one of the people that I know from uh, LARPing grew up in Chinatown and told me that their school actually split um, when they were growing up, which was in the 90s, uh, between whether you teach um, traditional or simplified Chinese characters. Um, so again, things that are ethnic centers, you will want to try to place in the ethnic centers. So again, the bilingual schools um, where, I mean, it's, it's going to be a bridge too far to do it, uh, to have schools that like actually prefer for the Gaokao or something. That's, just, I doubt it's going to be broadly acceptable the way that, oh, we teach Chinese and we are a very rigorous school like all of Asia is going to be. Um, but uh, so the so so when you but you, I'm trying to think of a good example of a density gradient in New York that's like opio shot so something that's just purely residential and local. Um, and I can't think of one. I mean, Jamaica will even Jamaica is eventually going to go there just because the jobs are getting are going are coming out of it. Um, maybe Queens Boulevard actually has this, this kind of density gradient where the buildings on Q, or on QB are bigger than the buildings not on QB. So you will want the schools to be not on QB because of traffic, but a block from QB. Like a place like, like this is a good place for a school. Um, and yeah, so this is a this be about schools and alternative transportation. This is very much. Yeah, no, the, yeah, 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 the, uh, by the way, speaking of New York, New York has the exact same thing, where, um, the, um, people who lived in the Queensbridge project actually were in favor of the Amazon, uh, HQ2 redevelopment proposal around here, and, um, in, in this area near the waterfront, um, which led to a lot of DSA people uh, decrying them as... I don't think they literally said false consciousness because they're stupid, but they're not that stupid. But they decided that the uh, uh, representative of this organization was not really representative. And it was very clear that zero of the DSA people were saying that ever set foot inside of any of the buildings in Queensbridge Amazon. Um, I'm not going to say they've never set foot um, in the streets internal to the project. I mean, I've done that just as a tourist. Uh, not as a tourist here, just as a tourist connecting, let's say, like going like this instead of like this. Um, but um, the, yeah, so it, it's actually a pretty common thing that left NIMBYs are constantly sticking away the fact that the people that they claim to speak for are never voting Corbyn. De Soto was right. De, De Soto was right about many things, but not entirely. Um, so, um, let's start with the fact that De Soto is specifically talking about informal settlements. He's not at all talking about issues of formal public housing. Um, now, there was a little bit of uh, uncertainty after communism fell about what to do with the public housing and. Uh, and the kind of, let's call it the Soto solution of just entitling the residents was used, but it's not the same. The, um, the, so the, the issue of the Soto is that he's, he's talking about um, issues of debt capital where a lot of money is being spent on, uh, on these housing, on, on these housing, I shouldn't say housing projects, on, let's say favela housing, um, Maybe I should not use the expression favela, which is Brazilian, and he was talking about Peru, but the equivalent like, about housing in informal neighborhoods, and um, and then there's so it's people with a lot of capital that they cannot borrow against, so it's dead capital. Um, so this actually is really important to his theory, and it turns out that entitling the squatters doesn't do anything because um, banks are not actually in the business of um, lending people uh, lending money when the collateral is an apartment that is by any kind of m even middle income standards let alone first world standards shitty in a shitty location um this has provided more stability 
the entitlement after it's done. So there's usually a problem with the um, with the process where if squatter. So what happens is, um, and it's happened in forgetting where maybe Colombia, where squatters were being entitled, and because the developers knew squatters are being entitled over this period of time, this is a really good time to try to evict the squatters so that the squatters will not get title and the developers doing the eviction will get the title. Um, so if you do the process, so you want to do the process very fast to give less room for this kind of, uh, um, for this kind of abuse. Once it is done, yeah, it does give a lot more stability. Um, over time, the buildings do get nicer because stuff is invested in them, but these are still buildings are owned by an individual, um, where there's essentially no scale. Um, occasionally you can maybe do a thing where the person who is assumed to be the big man in the neighborhood who owns a you know, building of six stories, let's say an apartment per floor, gets to be, gets formal title. Um, it's something that I don't know if it's happening, if it ever happened in Peru, but apparently the, the, the Hugh favelas uh, have a thing where um, you build a building and because these are such big cities and need so much more housing, um, someone pays you for the air rights to build a second story on top of your um, apartment and then someone pays them for the air rights so you can handle this through formalization but um and essentially tell a bunch of people you're not the big man you own six units the others owe you rent or something but um if that is the the local arrangement but that's very rare and usually it's just things that don't have scale um what do you mean japan is the sort of paradise i mean De Soto is specifically talking about issues of whether people who live in a place have legal title to it. Um, so De Soto specifically, uh, so, so, okay, okay, we don't need to interpret what is in De Soto because De Soto can tell us in one of his follow-up books that, he speak, that the United States is for him a very good example of um, legal uh, of giving people formal title, and he's giving the example of in the of in the nineteenth century under homesteading, um, there might have been a lot of conflicting claims, um, and um, so the, so the homesteading so, so the homesteading system was essentially was eventually the person who occupies the land is the one who's going to get legal title to it. Um, so he was so it's not something that you can really use to compare different developed countries. It's something that you can use to compare developing to developed countries. I would even say, I, I wouldn't say be developing, I would say middle income at this point to uh, develop. And of course, India is maybe not rich enough to be counted as middle income. But as I said earlier, India has disgusting levels of inequality. Um, it's It was unclear because um, all of this time surveys of Indian inequality what the hell what oh I'm saying why I'm getting why it's looking weird because in India the inequality that you might have seen in development reports from 15 years ago or older were from consumption surveys which showed much less inequality but now they're income surveys so let's see Canada just because it's in front of me on the eve of Corona, had a zero point three Gini index. Uh, Finland, so low Nordic inequalities, is two six point two six. France, point three, same as Canada. Uh, basically flat over the last forty plus years. You literally cannot see anything that Mitan did, or anything that Sarkozy, or, or, or anything that Chirac or Sarkozy did in this. Uh, Germany is also 0.3. Um, so maybe think of 0.3 as the kind of standard first world inequality, and then in a uh, very high inequality country like the United States is going to be a much higher number, like almost 0.4, like 0.39. Uh, UK is on the high side, so it's going to be 0.31. Uh, I'm going to not look at 20 because 20 is... A sharp point due to Corona, and often what happens in uh, recessions that is in high inequality places, uh, the year of the recession inequality falls, and then the year of recovery goes back. So, 
this is a fake number, same as in the United States, so three point, so point three one, basically the same as, and then, uh, and again, low is maybe Finland's point two six, um, where we are Norway, what's Norway also two points at point two six, and um, high is America point four. Uh, where is India? Yeah, Indian inequality. <laughs> I bring this up, so obviously, obviously the squatters are poor, right? But wait, no. The squatters live in cities. India has very well-known inequality between cities and rural areas. To the point that I would even call the squatters the poor of a middle-income country, except this country is not called India, but is called Mumbai. Um, and so... So the Soto, at any rate, is not at all about zoning. I don't remember reading anything about um, the benefits of individual property ownership as opposed to other first world models like public housing, like whatever you call the American model of very local zoning, um, or the British model. And not quite the same, but that's but, but it rhymes with the American one. He's talking specifically about the difference between a middle income country with a lot of conflicting land claims leading to um, quite a lot of housing that is informal and a rich country where all housing is formalized um, and squatters um, were either legalized which was hap happened in their American home setting or were kicked out as happened in, uh, in New York City. New York City had squatters who generally did not get title. Um, they were generally evicted during formalization. Um, so, so this is the Soto. Um, at any rate, schools are not very relevant to the Soto, I would say. I mean, so speaking of schools, so again, with schools, it's not a transportation issue, or it's very weakly a transportation issue, um, to the, only to the extent that um, you need a strong transport network for other things in order to um, strengthen the dense transit city. Um, through which the schools can embed and relative to that it's just a matter of where you locate the schools where should you locate the schools again if it's city wide you want city center ish locations maybe not literally the center because you're at, at some point competing with a 300 meter um tall office building but again near downtown brooklyn long island city battery park city the village east village places like that chinatown um, in New York City, in, in Berlin, the, the center is much lower kurtosis, so it's there are more such locations. Um, things that are not at city at the scale of a very large city, um, if the entire city is dense, or if it's a neighborhood with uniform density, which is again the case in much of let's say central Queens, just put it wherever you want it to be near the subway, but it doesn't have to be on the subway. Um, if you have a very large gradient uh, of, of density within a generally residential area, and I keep giving an example of Gopiusstadt, um, and the reason I keep it, giving it as an example is, first of all, I've been there, it's nice. Second, um, it actually does support good urbanism beyond just looking nice. Third, this is um, in a style that most urbanists nowadays hate because it's modernist. Um, so in a place like Gropiusstadt, you do want them, the schools should be co-located or very close with the neighborhood center. Um, in a place that's not at all a big city or, or embedded in a big city the way Gropiusstadt is, um, but is more suburban, you do absolutely want the schools to co-locate with the town center, which often means the train, the suburban train station to the city. I keep giving Fitchburg as the example. Um, leasehold is shit. Leasehold is not it is not what uh, he was talking about because leasehold under leasehold means that at least some, that someone is still entitled to redevelop. They won't because they're a tough little shit. But toffs are terrible. Is the left wing critique of why Latin America is the, is stagnant? The sort of is the right wing critique of why Latin America is stagnant. Um, but anyway, I'm going to stop here and see if people have questions, ideally not about Scotland or about DeSoto. I'm sorry, Warners.
D- don't forget, Singapore and Hong Kong are both leasehold. Singapore even builds housing. Hong Kong kind of doesn't, but... I mean, in Singapore, someone is empowered to make sure more housing is built. This person is called the government of Singapore, a.k.a. Li Shenlong. Yeah, they, I mean, they, and they're not very envy. They're a lot less envy than the private sectors of Japan and Korea, but they build housing. In Hong Kong, they don't, just because they're monopolistic little shits who manage, because Carrie Lam manages the very difficult feat of hating the people who she governs more than Li Xianlong hates the people he governs. Yes, I'm a pleb who eats uh, while waiting for people to type questions, eats chocolate on camera. This is how uh, refined my taste in chocolate is. Uh, it was on sale. Do I have lag? Do I have lag? All right. So if people don't have further questions that are not about either DeSoto or Scotland, again, sorry, Borners, um, then we can end now. I might want to vlog about the at some point because it is a fascinating topic. Um, and I have a lot of neoliberal followers, so. But anyway, about schools, as I said, it's a development issue or where you cite the schools issue. Please do not do what Massachusetts is doing and get towns to eat the schools into greenfields. Instead, get the towns to bring the schools back to the city center, to town center. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, again, if you have a, if you have a gradient, go on the down side of the gradient unless it comes from an office tower district. Um, you know, in other words, yeah, just the uh, the point is that at the end of the day, if you have a good work oriented um, public transport system, which is let's say what New York built, you will, I mean, the, the schools will fill in. That's fine to some extent. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, I mean the, the people, let's face it, the people who don't know what. Um, but anyway, so thank you all for watching, and I will see you either Tuesday or Saturday um, with another topic. So anyway, uh, thank you, and uh, ciao, ciao.